And without further ado, I will now let Paul introduce Isobel and chair the colloquium. Thanks, Valentin. So um, I'm not going to say too much um, other than to give a very brief introduction to Isabel Romero Shaw. Um, Isabel's a, one of our fantastic PhD students um, working with uh, Eric Thrain and myself. Uh, she is only or less than a couple of years into her PhD um, and after completing her master's um, in Birmingham. So I'm going to pass it over to her. She's going to tell us about some very exciting news and, and in particular one event that LIGO detected uh, almost not so recently now because uh, we've known about it for a long time but uh, the public has only known about it for uh, a little bit over a week. Uh, but Isabel has worked significantly on this event over that last year and a bit uh, and so she's going to tell us about all of the exciting science to come from it. Take it away Isabel. Thank you very much for that introduction, Paul. Um, I'll just get the screen sharing going. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the gravitational wave merger event named GW190521. Um, as Paul says, I've been working on this event and in fact most of OSGRAV and LIGO, at least the LIGO members of OSGRAV have been aware of this event for quite some time and have been talking about it and working on it pretty much since it happened in May last year. So yeah, we've been excited about it for a while um, and it's a real pleasure to be presenting this exciting discovery to you today. Okay, so let's go over the basics first. What is this big detection that I'm going to be talking to you about today? Well, it was detected on the 21st of May last year, um, although it happened about 7 billion actual years ago um, and 17 billion light years away. So about 2 times 10 to the 14 kilometers away, which is pretty far. Um, it was detected by the three gravitational wave observatories, um, the two LIGO detectors in the US, so this is Hanford represented here, uh, Livingston and Virgo in Italy. Um, it's a binary black hole merger event um, and we've seen lots of these with LIGO and Virgo before but this one is special because of its high masses. Um, it's the most massive event we've detected in gravitational waves. The most massive of the pair which we call the primary was 85 solar masses and the less massive secondary was about 66 solar masses and they radiated away about eight solar masses worth of energy when they merged. Um, leaving behind a remnant which is about 142 solar masses. So this new black hole um, is also very exciting because it's the first ever directly detected intermediate mass black hole. Now I should be careful when I say that um, to mention that not all people classify black holes as intermediate mass until they get to a thousand solar masses but in the gravitational wave community we consider anything over a hundred solar masses um, to be intermediate mass and I'll be sticking with that definition for, with that definition for the rest of this talk. So, when the two black holes merged, they made an intermediate mass black hole. But what is that? Well, black holes come in three main flavors when it comes to mass. We have stellar mass, which we've seen before in gravitational waves. Um, technically, this goes up to 100 solar masses, but we'd only seen them up to about 50 solar masses before this event. Um, we also know about supermassive black holes, which we believe to exist in the centers of all galaxies. Um, and then you have intermediate mass black holes, which are from 100 to about 10,000 solar masses. Um, and again, this is the LIGO and Virgo defined lower limit that we talk about when we're talking about this kind of intermediate mass black hole. Um, so as I said before, uh, intermediate mass black holes have never before been confidently detected. We had seen hints of them before, for example, by studying the movements of stars and things like globular clusters. Um, but these observations could always be equally well explained by something else. So this event marks our first observational foray into intermediate mass black holes, which is very exciting. So in terms of other binary black hole events, um, we can compare this new event to the mergers that we detected in GWTC1. Um, so I've labeled the first binary black hole observation GW150914 here and the heaviest event in GWTC1, which was 1707-29. 
Um, and you can see that the masses of the components here have only ever been seen in the remnants of previous mergers, um, which perhaps foreshadows the conclusion of my talk a little bit, but I'll keep that for later. So why do we care about intermediate mass black holes? Why is this observation so important? Well, as I've mentioned, they've not been detected before. Um, so they give us this kind of missing link in the evolution from stellar to supermassive black holes. Um, and that just means that we understand our universe that little bit better. They also help us to understand the evolution of star systems like globular clusters. Um, they're predicted to be at the center of some globular clusters. And they might also help us understand how dwarf galaxies evolve. They might also be a big source um, of gravitational wave radiation for future space-based detectors, um, which will have good low frequency sensitivity. So that's something like LISA, um, the space-based interferometer that's planned for sometime in the next 10 years, I think. Um, and so we need to know if these things exist in order to plan for them. So that's both for detecting them and also for subtracting their signals from the data if there are lots of, the, of these things and their signals overlap with the signals of other things that we also want to see. So here's a video um, from Mark Myers from Osgraph showing an artist's impression of the event itself. I'm just going to let this play out and finish up and then I'll explain what's going on. So as you just saw, the components were orbiting each other for a while um, and they were embedded in this two-dimensional fabric looking thing which represents the fully four-dimensional fabric of space-time and the ripples that you saw at the end um, are representing the gravitational waves that we detect. So this is what the gravitational wave signal looks like in the detector. The arms of the detectors are shown in these graphics at the top, um, which were made by Daniel Williams. Um, so these are just some nice little, little cartoons of them, which I think are quite, uh, quite pretty. Um, the space-time stretching and squeezing changes the detector arm length by one part in about 10 to the 21-ish. So the strain, which is the change in length divided by the, the original length, is about 10 to the minus 21. The light is, so there's some light is, and it's split down each arm, and we time how long it takes to go up and down a bunch of times, and then we recombine the beams. And if the arms have changed length at all, um, due to being stretched and squeezed by the gravitational wave, then we uh, see some unexpected interference, which tells us the amplitude and the frequency of the gravitational wave. Um, so the plot on this slide is taken from the 1905-21 detection paper. And on this slide, I've listed two papers, um, the detection paper and the astrophysical implications paper. So in the detection paper, uh, Rory Smith from Monash contributed some analyses for the detection paper and um, Juan Coderam Basio uh, formerly of Monash, was on the editorial team for the Astrophysical Implications paper. So when the space-time ripples pass through the detector, we see the tiny oscillation in the lengths of the arms that they cause, um, and this, is, this then becomes a strain measurement, um, which is shown in the time domain in the top panels of this plot. So this is Hamford and Livingston and Burgo that you see here. And on the bottom panels, we have the time frequency power spectrogram. So this is actually a very short signal, which you might be able to notice if you compare it to the classic chirp signal that we saw in 1509-14, the first gravitational wave detection, um, which is pictured here on the Osgrab logo. And we can see that there are far fewer oscillations in 1905-21 um, before the big peak, which is when the merger happens. So we say that this signal has fewer cycles in band, um, which essentially means that because the objects are so massive, um, they don't reach the orbital frequency that's needed for them to be picked up by the detectors. Uh, so that's about 5 hertz orbital frequency and 10 hertz gravitational wave frequency um, until right before they merge. So we don't get to see them orbit each other very much at all. Okay, so now we come to where I'm going to try and play you the interview. Um, so gravitational waves are detected from about 10 hertz to about 6,000 hertz. And the human hearing range goes from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. So let me try and play you this. Um, you may not be able to hear it. Did you hear that? Did you hear something? If not, um, I know. So I know it's hard to hear. I've got a substitution, um, which relies on my stress ball here, which is a bit deflated. I've clearly been squeezing it a lot recently. Um, and the signal essentially sounds exactly like the sound of my stress ball here. <laughs> hitting the floor when I throw it down. So it sounds exactly like this. 
don't know if you heard that, but I hope you did. <laughs> so it sounds like a thump, like someone throwing a big lump of something onto the floor. So the components are so massive um, and the signal there's therefore so low frequency that this is all we can hear at the frequencies that it was actually detected. So there are a couple of important points here. Um, the, the waveform that I just played and which you maybe did or didn't hear uh, is the waveform that the LVC analysis thinks matches the data and not the signal itself. Um, and it's also important uh, for me to point out that the waveform I've drawn on this slide is just an illustration. It's not a real waveform and it probably breaks GR or something, so don't look at it too closely. Okay, here's another version of that same signal, and um, this time it's shifted to higher frequencies so that it's easier to hear and so that there are more cycles in band. So I'll play this to you in a second, um, but another important thing, uh, another couple of points to make. So again, the waveform on this slide is just an illustration and not a real simulation. Um, and the signal you're about to hear is just a longer version of the waveform that the LVC analysis thinks matches the data best and not the signal itself. So if you listen carefully, um, you might be able to hear that the amplitude goes up and down a bit. Um, and this is due to something in the LBC best fit waveform called precession, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute. So let's see if you can hear this. Hopefully that was a little bit more audible than the last one. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So what we actually detected was something short and fast, more like the first waveform I played you. So we then have to translate this signal um, or translate the interview, if you like, into a language that we understand. So what's it telling us about the masses and spins and distance um, and the other parameters of the source? So what can we learn from the signal? And what we do is Bayesian inference, which is essentially the following. We uh, get data, we get the data that we've detected. We overlay um, our simulated waveform and we figure out the probability that the data contains that waveform given our prior knowledge of the probability of that system occurring at all. Um, and we use some method of exploring the parameter space. So for example, an MCMC, um, and we do this and we construct a posterior probability distribution. So by doing this, the LVC were able to work out what kind of system produced the signal that we saw in the detectors. Um, and this, uh, this plot on this slide is the plot showing the two-dimensional posterior probability distribution um, for the two component masses. So we have the two-dimensional posterior probability distribution in the main panel and then the projected um, one-dimensional posteriors on the primary mass and the secondary mass in the side and the top panels. So in this plot, the blue line outlines, blue curve, sorry Paul, the blue curve outlines a 90% confidence interval um, and the blue shading indicates the intensity of posterior support so that it peaks, um, you can see that it peaks at around 80 solar masses for the primary and 66 solar masses for the secondary. So as you heard, or didn't hear, the signal um, is very low pitch, very short, very low frequency, and this is a problem for us because there, this means that there, are, there is less data um, containing the signal, so less information for us to glean from the data. Um, and it's also, really hard to tell what's going on during the in spiral of the system um, when they're falling together and spiraling around each other because we can't see a lot of that part of the signal. And there's also a problem on theoretical grounds because a signal this short um, can only have come from a source in this kind of forbidden mass range that we call the upper mass gap. So why is there a forbidden range of masses for black holes and why is it forbidden? So this has to do with pair instability supernovae this plot on this slide is taken from a paper by Hager and Woosley in 2002. Um, so that's Alex Hager from Monash. And the x-axis shows the initial star mass, which is not the same as the core mass. This is the mass the star has um, at, at zero age main sequence. Um, and the red curve on this plot shows the remnant mass. So the mass that this, uh, this star then has when it dies. Um, and the blue line shows the star mass just before it undergoes the event that turns it into whatever remnant it's going to turn into. So for very massive stars, we have electron-positron pair instability after carbon burning. This leads to reduce, so it's reduced pressure in the core, and um, the outer layers collapse inwards, and the core photons become electron-positron pairs. This begins as a pulsational instability, um, and the violence of the pulses increases as the star's mass increases. Um, so at the kind of lower end of this gap here, we have the pulsations 
shrinking the star a bit, so every pulse releases some mass um, until the mass is low enough that the electron-positron pairs can't be formed, and then the star undergoes a normal supernova, having lost enough mass that it doesn't form a really massive um, black hole. So, when, and then at the other end, when it's massive enough to have just one incredibly violent single pulse, it just explodes. So if you have an initial star with a mass about uh, 100 to 140 solar masses, the pulsational parent stability ejects the outer layers of the star before it collapses. Um, so it might have a mass within this gray box here. Um, and above an initial mass of about 260 solar masses, the star just directly collapses to a black hole. So we expect to see remnants of this process and that's above the upper mass gap. But between initial star masses um, of about 140 and 260, the star gets completely disrupted by one pulse and no remnant is formed there either. Um, so this leads to a mass gap between about 50 and about 150 solar masses, which is indicated here. And this is pretty much exactly where 1905-21 lies. So in simple terms, this means that a star with a core mass less than about 60 solar masses, but more than eight solar masses, um, will undergo a normal supernova and collapse to a black hole. But a star with a core mass between about 60 and about 130 solar masses will um, either shed a lot of mass and collapse to a smaller black hole or blow itself apart completely, leaving nothing behind. So we need another option for forming black holes with the masses seen in 1905-21. So there are two key channels when we are talking about making binary black holes that merge within the age of the universe. We have isolated and dynamical. And in the isolated channel, two stars evolve side by side until they die and merge. So in order for them to do this within the age of the universe, we need some kind of special procedure like common envelope evolution or chemically homogeneous evolution um, which Ilya Mandel here at Monash can tell you a lot more about. However, parent stability supernovae uh, limit our hopes for this channel. So our other option, which is dynamical evolution, um, occurs in dense regions of space uh, where there's lots of stellar material and stellar remnants. And examples of such regions are things like active galactic nuclei and globular clusters. So in globular clusters, the mass segregates, so all of the most massive objects sink to the center of the globular cluster and you end up with a dense core full of dark compact objects with a lot of kinetic energy taken from dynamical interactions with other compact objects. And objects interact often, becoming bound to each other and interacting with other binaries and other single objects. Um, and so if you have a pair of black holes, they may interact with another object. Um, and sometimes the new object replaces one of the original black holes, sometimes it doesn't. But either way, whichever binary leaves the interaction usually has a smaller separation than the one going in. So repeated interactions of this kind can lead to a rapid shrinking of the binary, which means that you will eventually end up with a very close binary that merges before it has a chance to interact with something else. And this can happen very fast, uh, in as little as even like four days since the previous interaction. So in globular clusters, you can also have these things called gravitational wave capture mergers, where two initially unbound objects um, become bound and merge very quickly because they pass each other very closely and gravitational wave emission rapidly shrinks their separation and they merge. And importantly for this new event, 1905-21, merger product, merger product sorry, in this kind of environment um, may then go on to merge again if they're able to be retained within that environment. Um, and another thing that can happen in such dense environments um, is stellar mergers. And there is one school of thought that thinks that sometimes these stellar mergers can give rise to massive stars that don't undergo pulsational parent stability supernova and directly collapse to a black hole um, of the masses involved in 1905-21. And in such a dense environment, these um, mass gap direct collapse black holes might then also go on to merge dynamically. Okay, so this is a simulation by Johan Samsing showing um, the kind of dynamical interaction that might take place in a globular cluster core. And it shows three equal mass black holes interacting. So you'll see a binary come in and be interrupted by a third object. As the interactions continue to play out, you'll notice the binary orbit getting less and less circular, as well as getting closer and closer. 
And this kind of interaction gives us merger properties that differ from the properties of isolated binary black holes in ways that we can infer from the signal. So as I mentioned, you can see that here the orbit is not circular. Um, and this is one of the things that can show up in the signal and something I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that if this new black hole went on to merge again with this other black hole here, we'd be able to tell that it had merged already since it's now significantly more massive. So when we have detected a binary black hole merger, we can try to distinguish um, the dynamical from the isolated mergers by asking the following questions. So let's ask these of 1905-21. Is it very massive? Even just from this, yes, it looks like it formed dynamically. Um, but that would be a very short interview, so let's keep asking questions. So do its components have misaligned spins? Well, let me explain to you what that means and why it's significant, and then we'll take a look at what the data has to say. So when we talk about aligned spins, we mean that the spins are aligned with each other and with the angular momentum vector of the binary. This is typically the case for isolated mergers. Um, there's no reason for them not to be aligned, so we expect them to be aligned. Out of alignment spins cause orbital precession. So this means that uh, the spin vector of the components um, has components in the plane of the orbit, which causes the orbit to precess. And the population of dynamical mergers is expected to have an, an isotropic distribution of spins um, since they may be spinning in any direction when they meet, so these mergers are more likely to be processing. So this is the LVC precession measurement for 1905-21. On the left, we have a 2D posterior probability distribution over the effective spin parameter, chi f, on the y-axis, and the effective precession parameter, chi p, on the x-axis. Um, and the 1D precession posterior is in the panel at the top. The prior distribution in black shows us what we would expect to see if the data contained no information about whether the binary was processing or not. And we can see that the posterior in blue deviates from this prior significantly um, and suggests that there is significant precession. And on the right, we have the component spin tilt angles with posterior support intensity represented in the color of the pixel. Um, so a non-processing system would have zero tilt of the spin axis, and here both of them are tilted at almost 90 degrees, as shown by the fact that the, the blue color gets a lot more intense around the 90 degree mark. Uh, so this is a GIF made by someone from Virgo, um, which shows the spin directions measured for 1905-21. And in this GIF, uh, the plane of the orbit is kind of a horizontal line across the screen. And as we saw in the plots on the previous slide, both the components um, have spin axes which are tilted substantially. Okay, so we can go back to our questions. Are the spins misaligned, i.e. is there precession? Yes, it looks like it. So how about this final question about eccentricity? Again, I'll explain to you what this means before we take a look at the data. So what is orbital eccentricity? Eccentricity describes the shape of the binary's orbit, so a non-eccentric circular orbit looks like this one, with the plane of the orbit pointing either into or out of the page. A circular orbit is typical of isolated binaries, since this is the most energy efficient orbital configuration, um, and gravitational waves are very efficient at circularizing orbits since they carry away the orbital energy. Um, isolated binaries typically orbit each other for a very long time before they merge, so any non-circularity in the orbit introduced by something like a supernova of one of the components is expected to have, to have been erased by the gravitational radiation long before the orbital frequency of the binary is sufficient to be detected. Eccentric orbits look more squashed, like this one, um, again with the plane of the orbit pointing either into or out of the page. Eccentricity can have a value between zero and one, with zero meaning the orbit is circular and one meaning it's essentially a head-on collision. So from simulations performed by people like Johann Samsing and Carl Rodriguez and others, um, we expect globular cluster mergers to be more likely to be eccentric, um, with about 5% of mergers with eccentricity greater than or equal to 0.1, um, at a gravitational wave frequency of 10 hertz, which is when the signal reaches the detector. 
And this is because in globular clusters, um, binaries often become bound with significant eccentricity. Um, and then because they go on to merge so fast, they don't have time to lose their orbital eccentricity through gravitational radiation. Sadly, it turns out the measuring eccentricity is hard. Um, the LVC analysis of 1905-21 could not measure eccentricity because their waveform models don't account for it. Um, there's been a relative lack of development of eccentric waveforms um, relative to waveforms incorporating things like the effects of precession um, because we expected most of our mergers to be circular. Therefore, our eccentric waveform models are re really slow to generate um, and this makes them impossible to use for standard Bayesian inference. However, in 2019, um, my supervisors and I used a likelihood reweighting method to constrain the eccentricity of GWTC1 events. So we do this by effectively important sampling our parameter space using a circular quick to generate waveform model. And then uh, we reweight those posterior samples using the likelihood we get when we analyze with an eccentric model. So in the plot on this slide, I'm showing the 90% credible upper limit on eccentricity at 10 Hertz for the 10 uh, GWTC1 binary black hole mergers um, that we obtained using this method. So the reweighting method that we use is limited um, to an upper limit of an eccentricity of 0.2 at 10 Hertz, uh, partially due to waveform limitations, um, partly because we need the waveform to be similar enough to the circular waveform that the posterior samples cover the correct regions of the parameter space. And this obviously was not a problem for GWTC1, this upper limit, um, but it does seem to be a problem for 1905-21, which I'll show you in a second. Another thing to mention is that the eccentric waveform that we use is restricted to aligned spins, so we can't look at precession using this waveform model. And again, this was not really a problem for GWTC1 since there was no strong evidence for precession, but it is for 1905-21, um, since as I showed you, the evidence for precession is fairly strong. And the final thing to mention is that we use Bilby for all of our Bayesian analysis, uh, which is a wonderful code package developed primarily at Monash um, in its early days, although it's now being used by many different groups around the world who are also contributing to development. So here is what we got uh, when we applied our reweighting method to the data of 1905-21. So we put this paper online about a week and a half ago and we submitted it to AppJ Letters. So this is shown on the left, uh, the eccentricity posterior for 1905-21. The prior, so this is our assumption about the distribution of eccentricities that we expect to get, um, is shown in gray, it's log uniform in eccentricity. And the posterior probability is outlined in black. And what we can see here is that the posterior probability is very much railing against the upper limit. Um, it looks like it wants to be going higher than we can actually see with our method. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, however, as I mentioned, we can't, uh, we can't see the precession when we're restricted to aligned spins. So we also did an analysis um, doing normal Bayesian inference, um, very similar to the LVC uh, posterior that we saw a few slides back, um, and that's shown here. So in this case, we get a strong precession measurement when we analyze using a processing waveform that doesn't include eccentricity. So the issue here is that both eccentricity and precession can cause phase and amplitude modulation in the signal. Um, and we don't really know which one this one is, because when we compare the two measurements, by comparing the base factors, we find that they are almost equally well preferred by the data, um, at least when we use the full prior range. Um, so using the full prior range biases us a little bit against the eccentric hypothesis because so much of the posterior support here is very, very low. Um, when we only compare the posteriors above an eccentricity of 0.1, we find that the eccentric hypothesis is mildly preferred with a natural log base factor of about two, which isn't it's not that substantial. So it's still not a huge preference. Um, so can we trust either of these measurements? To investigate the answer to that question, um, we performed some 1905-21 like injection studies. We injected a range of models, some processing, some eccentric and some neither. So I'll draw your attention to some specific cases that outline our problem. 
So if we look at the pink injection on the bottom panels, um, this is an eccentric, non-spinning, non-processing injected waveform. Um, sorry, this is a, yeah, so this is an eccentric, non-spinning, non-processing injected waveform. Um, however, when we analyze it with our processing non-eccentric model, we see this strong procession signature. Now, if we look at the dark blue injection in the middle panel, um, this is a non-eccentric and processing injected waveform. But when we analyze it with our eccentric non-processing model, it looks like it's eccentric. So the story seems to be that we cannot currently really tell the difference very well for such a short signal with such limited in spiral. Um, and we only know that both procession and eccentricity fit the signal well. So as an extra data point, let's also quickly mention some work um, led by Juan Coderon Bostillo, previously of Monash, um, now at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, in our analysis, we can only go out to mild eccentricities, um, up to eccentricities of 0.2 at 10 hertz. Um, but Juan is focusing on the more extreme end of the scale, which is E equals 1, a head-on collision. Um, and he had a couple of papers out on this, showing that procession will also be confused with head-on collisions um, for this mass range. So if you're interested in this, you can check out his papers. Um, and I think he'll also be doing a colloquium talk on his work soon. So just to answer our final question about eccentricity, um, the evidence, such as there is, also seems to point to 1905-21 being a dynamically formed merger from the eccentricity measurement. So what does our measurement mean for the population of binary black hole mergers if 1905-21 is eccentric? Well, as I mentioned before, we expect about 5% of globular cluster mergers to have an eccentricity greater than or equal to 0.1 at 10 hertz, which is 1 in 20. So for every one eccentric merger we see, we know that there are something like 19 other binary black hole mergers coming from the dynamical formation in globular clusters channel um, that aren't eccentric. So going with this one in 20 number, we'd expect to see at least one more eccentric merger in the data that LIGO and Virgo took in their third observing run, O3A. Um, going on just public alerts, there are something like 30 more mergers from this observing run, making a total of about 40. So we're working on this analysis right now, so you can keep your eyes peeled for our results. Uh, this statement does come with a few caveats though, since um, globular clusters may not be the only environment in which eccentric mergers are formed. We also mentioned um, AGN, and they may also be field triples that experience cause a little of resonance. Um, it's also very hard to detect highly eccentric signals under standard compact binary merger searches. Um, so, uh, so some of those may be missed um, and then we wouldn't notice them and we wouldn't analyze them using our method. So then um, those, those wouldn't be counted um, in, our, in our count of eccentric uh, mergers. But we are inching our way closer to being able to distinguish the formation channels of binary black holes, which is exciting. And another exciting thing, of course, is that we've seen the first observational evidence of an intermediate mass black hole and we've actually seen it forming. Um, so another, finally, the, the final important thing to note is that if this binary is not eccentric at all, um, then it's processing, which is also evidence of dynamical formation. So we may not be able to decipher everything about this event um, from its very, very short signal, um, but it's given us just enough to go on that we think it probably was dynamically formed. And I'll just leave up uh, this nice illustration of the hierarchical merger scenario um, where repeated mergers build up to give us 1905-21. And that is it from me. Wonderful, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, virtual claps for a wonderful talk. <laughs> I'm not sure who that was, but thank you for unmuting. Um, <laughs> would anyone like to ask some questions? We have uh, quite a bit of time. I'm gonna, um, so Alex has put something in the chat. Um, we'll read that out in just a second. Um, but especially the younger folk in the audience, um, if anyone has any particular questions they'd like to ask about this event or anything else to do with this talk.
I've got a question. Go on, Bernard. Thank Do you. Do we have any idea where this merger occurred? We have a, a sky map, if that's your question. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I actually, I have an extra slide with it on. Um, so this is taken from the paper that was about the candidate electromagnetic counterpart. Um, and it also includes the sky map for 1905-21, which you can see here. Mm -hmm. Is there any like globular clusters or something in that region? Well, um, there's this, uh, this event, which is related to an AGN. Um, globular clusters are so small and so widely spread throughout the universe that there's almost certainly globular clusters within this region. So there, there's a lot potentially in that yeah. region. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have a, <clears throat> I have a question, of course. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, my, All right, my, go on, Rosemary. Thanks, Paul. Um, my question is about uh, eccentricity. Um, do you fit for the eccentricity directly or do you uh, do what we do in the planet world and fit for E cos omega and E cos and E sine omega? Um, e. Where the omega is the argument of periastron or the, the uh, longitude of periastron. Yeah, we fit for the eccentricity directly. Our waveform model doesn't include the argument of periastron as a variable, so we are limited by that. Because uh, the eccentricity is the positive quantity, and so you're always going to be biased towards non-zero values, whereas if you uh, fit for these things that I mentioned, you allow for, well, the quantities can be positive and negative and you get a much less biased fit. So I guess that I, introduces another parameter, but um, I think it's very important and, and perhaps explains the bias towards non-zero that you see. I would say that I don't think our analysis is biased to non-zero because of the analysis that we did of previous events where we saw that all of the posterior support was at very very low eccentricities. Um, like but when the eccentricity is actually very low uh, it's impossible not to be biased if you fitting for a quantity that's, that can only be positive or zero. So, right, that's Maybe we can take this discussion offline. I think it. I think it comes down to your choice of prior, and I think we we can show definitively that we're not biased. But I think this is a, a technical discussion for a, uh, a public, well, for a general colloquium. So this is something we can we can talk about. I would I would also just point out that I think um, the level to which we can distinguish eccentricity is probably higher than the level of the bias, as in. If we were biased to slightly higher eccentricities, that would probably, those slightly higher eccentricities would probably be covered by the noise anyway, give, just given um, the posteriors that we got for the earlier events. Maybe I can show you those posteriors and we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Isabel, so just to follow the discussion, uh, Ilya has just posted in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it, but in principle, you have a phase variable associated with eccentricity, so you could actually plot a posterior on a quantity like the one Rosemary suggested, right? Interesting. That would be interesting. It's important that you do that, I think. So it's the argument of periastron. But again, I think we can, uh, we can follow this up offline. Uh, Michelle has her hand up. Go ahead, please. You are unmute, but I certainly cannot hear you. I don't know if anyone else. Is that better? That was better, thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, intuitively to me, I would think that like larger objects are easier to detect. So could you like explain why we are getting lots of detections of like small black hole mergers and this is the first kind of larger black hole merger that we've seen? And why aren't we seeing larger ones? 
Yeah, well, one of the reasons for that is this, um, this kind of forbidden mass range that we were talking about earlier. So we don't expect to see things there and we haven't seen things there a lot, um, which kind of matched what we thought was going on in the universe. And that's why this event is some, something of a surprise. And the other thing is that when you have really massive um, binaries, the frequency with which they orbit each other is lower, which means that they shift to lower frequencies in um, LIGO's, LIGO and Virgo's detection band. Um, and LIGO and Virgo are only sensitive um, from a, a, a frequency of about 10 hertz up. Um, and for those heavier things, they shift below 10 hertz, so you just don't see them because they're not orbiting each other quickly enough. Awesome, thank you. I can see that Alex has his hand up despite uh, his, his lack of presence in his own Zoom window. Um, but uh, go ahead, Alex. But I again encourage young folk to ask, keep asking questions, please. Okay, um, so I have a, a note. So uh, even when you form a black hole, there, is, there can still, still be some fallback uh, that gives the black hole a kick if, if in a single star. So the collapse doesn't have to be always uh, symmetric if you, you can get some kicks uh, in the black hole formation in a binary system so they don't have to be born um, yeah, without eccentricity. And the second, uh, quite, but that's just a note, uh, the question I have is, so when you have a merger of black holes from the gravitational wave emission, there can also be a kick. And I, I seem to recall Paul told me once it could be up to, the velocity could be say something like 3% the speed of light. Uh, if you get such a big kick, depending on spin alignment and so forth, um, would that uh, uh, not expel uh, the binary or the, the massive uh, black hole that you form from the globular cluster system? If you make, want to make the bigger, star, uh, the bigger black holes from um, mergers of smaller black holes, would that be a problem that in the merger, these systems could get a kick that would expel them from globular clusters? Yeah, that, that is considered to be um, an issue. So you would need either something like a very, very high central density to, to increase the escape velocity so that they don't escape. Um, but the other thing that the um, in the LBC paper they consider to be kind of one of the more promising scenarios is if you have these stellar mergers inside a cluster um, that then merge at a very specific point in their evolution and then collapse directly to a black hole. Those black holes wouldn't have such a significant kick so they wouldn't necessarily get kicked out and then they could go on to merge again um, in, in that dense environment. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Hi. Okay, I have a very naive question, I think. Uh, so, but it is not clear for me uh, why these merger uh, are attributed to black hole. Is it only related with the mass extracted from the data? Or are there any other reasons? So I think, um, at least in the LBC analysis and in our analysis, we, in our analysis, we are assuming that they're black holes. Um, in some of Juan's work, he looks at the, um, the hypothesis that they might be something else like a Proca star, which is this, um, this kind of exotic matter type thing. Um, and I think there have also been other analyses that look at whether it's uh, a string signal and things like that. Maybe Paul can talk a bit more on those because I think he was involved a little bit in those analyses. Um, but there were analyses that looked at other options um, and at least within the, the analyses that have kind of within the LBC realm, um, this hypothesis was deemed to be the most likely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can, I can add, because um, you prompted me, I wouldn't want to otherwise. Um, but so we did absolutely as part of the, the LIGO analysis, LIGO-Virgo analysis, we looked to see if this could be a cosmic string um, using various models that people have come up with for the way they emit gravitational waves. And it simply doesn't fit the signal for various reasons. Um, but the other thing I'll add to, to Isabel's answer, um, 
in terms of the makeup of the star, just from a uh, pure dynamics perspective, it, once you know the mass, which we get from the gravitational wave analysis, then the merger frequency, you know, the, the star has to be uh, more compact than a certain limit. Otherwise it would have merged at lower frequencies. So the fact that it doesn't merge at much lower frequencies means it has to be incredibly compact. So these can't be just, you know, garden variety stars or anything along those lines, um, which is why we're naturally led to them being black holes. Ah, compactness uh, is important. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's a beautiful, I can, I can point this to you afterwards. There's a beautiful um, paper that the LVC wrote after the first gravitational wave event, 1509-14, where it goes through this calculation, but in a very back of the envelope kind of way. And you can, you can play with it. Um, you can play with the maths yourself and, you know, just through Keplerian dynamics and, and very simple sort of undergraduate type uh, maths and physics, you can show that the, those two black holes that merged there, or sorry, those two objects that merged there had to be within uh, very close to the Schwarzschild radius. They couldn't be much more, much broader than that, or much, much bigger than that. Okay, I can see that uh, there's Ilya and, and Alex are, are having discussion in the chat, but I don't think that requires a response. Uh, does anyone else have any last, last questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace, or not, just contact Isabel afterwards. Yeah, well, me and my emails on the slide. <laughs> Can I ask about this, uh, the, the um, formation scenario um, that you, you mentioned um, Samsung's work, uh, but you, and you listed a couple of scenarios that scattering, uh, shrinking by scattering, Mm -hmm. and uh, single, single capture. But the uh, my money beyond um, the Samsung <laughs> uh, path, uh, but you didn't really talk about, uh, you know, the, the background, you know, you showed a little animation, gorgeous animation, <laughs> but you didn't really talk about the um, importance of, of that... Uh, Path. What can you say a bit more about that? I mean, well, the importance of the um, the scattering and the other kind of many body encounters that you have in globular clusters leads to the five percent number. So that's th these are the things that are likely to merge with the higher eccentricities, and the other things in the clusters that merge through other kinds of interactions. So maybe they just form and then they're in some outer region of the cluster so they're not interacting with other things dynamically they would merge and they would probably look a lot like an isolated binary um so so those would I be think, sorry Karina. no no i was going to say i i think the important thing about the these scattering experiments is that it, well for example the single single capture going back a step mm -hmm. The, these things, there's a certain cross sections, very small actually, okay, it's of the order of the Schwarzschild radius. But when you have binary, binaries, the cross section for, for a, an interaction is the, the semi major axis of the binary. And, and uh, in dense stellar environments, uh, well, you have many binaries, although they will necessarily be very tight binaries, which is exactly what you want, uh, but their cross section's much bigger, and that's the most important aspect of, of the story, I think. And, uh, and then when they do find each other, which they do often if the stellar density is high, uh, they'll do interesting things like we saw in that uh, animation, and in particular, uh, they induce eccentricity, which you, you pointed out, and they force uh, the, a pair to be close at periastron. And actually, the little animation you showed of an eccentric binary wasn't quite right. You, you know, they actually orbit the centre of mass and they, um, you know, you, you'd see two individual um, orbits. But that, the point of that is that you, they come, can, 
be very close at periastron, and that's where you can force mergers. That's that's my um, take on the story, and has been for several decades. <laughs> and I'm really pleased to see that this is, you know, coming alive through the gravitational wave detections. Yeah, so I'd be pushing, <laughs> pushing on that, and thinking, thinking hard about, yeah, what you can do with that. Happy to talk to you sometime, yeah, <laughs> even in person one day. Yeah, <laughs> one yeah. day. Um, I see Michael continues to unmute and mute himself. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> uh, no, I was waiting to the end. I just wanted to thank Isabel and everyone for attending. I think it's extremely important that we continue with seminars and colloquia and uh, I'd urge uh, everyone to think about uh, arranging for suitable speakers. I, I've noticed at other institutions I'm seeing uh, some activity and I think it's a really important thing more so than ever uh, before and uh, yes the trajectory is looking looking good and I think it's, it's not going to be in the far distant future where we will be able to physically interact of course we will have us an impact parameter of 1.5 meters but nonetheless we will still have that that uh, possibility so thank you very much isabel it's it's really a pleasure to hear about this work i just i'm amazed i i just constantly reflect back to that time in 19, 19 in 2015 when i was called into the jl william meeting room by paul and uh, yuri and uh, eric and and sat down, I thought, oh my God, what, what, what's happening here? And they said, sit down. And I thought, how much are they asking for? Which in those days wasn't a big deal. Today, it's a very big deal. And uh, they told me about the discovery and I was, my jaw dropped. And I still am amazed at the activity in this area and how much, how much research has been done and discoveries that are taking place on a, on a monthly basis. I really hope that we do see some detection of cosmic strings. I have a soft spot for cosmic strings that go back a few decades and it would be nice to see that there they have some reality in our universe anyway thank you very much isabel thank you for having me thank you isabel thank you everyone